my friends, and welcome to episode number 24 of the Classical Guitar Composers Podcast, the show that features original classical guitar compositions from around the globe. As always, I am your host, Chris Hales, and if this is the first time you're joining me, this show is simply a place where you can get your original classical guitar compositions heard, and they will be heard around the world. We have listeners all over the globe. All you have to do is send an mp3 recording to chris at classicalguitarcomposers.com. It's that simple, I air it on the show. The only rule is that it must contain a classical guitar. So I'm very glad to be with you today. Got a couple things I'm going to go over before we jump into the music. I have this special little folder in my phone where I put ideas that come into my head of things that I might like to talk about on this show. You know, every now and then I'll be, like, working and and I'll start, you know, I'll, ju- I'll just go down a train of thought and then I will, ha- I will sit and say all these amazing things inside my mind and I will just spew wisdom and I think, I should talk about that on the show, but it never quite comes out of my mouth the way it starts in my brain. But nonetheless, I have this little folder of ideas, but I haven't opened it for a while, and so I wasn't really sure what I was going to talk about today. So I opened it, and I was looking back, and there's all these ideas that I don't think I ever did. Like, I have one here that says Danglers in Italy. And it took me a minute to remember what that was, but I think what that is... A year or two ago, I read the book The Count of Monte Cristo. And there was a part that made me laugh because there's a character who is French and he travels to Italy and he doesn't speak Italian and he doesn't know any Italian words and uh, but his daughter uh, his daughter is like a singer and she's taking music lessons so the only Italian words he's ever heard are like musical terms so he's walking around Italy going Allegro! Vivace! (laughs) <laughs> like just giving out like tempo directions <laughs> and it made me laugh really hard and I thought I would share that with all of you and I don't know if I ever did now if I did already I apologize because I simply forgot um, I have another one here that says follow up to keys discussion Tedesco backward concerto so that, that was an old one, because that would have been right after um, I brought up w- w- the whole musical keys discussion we had, like, last year. And uh, what I'm referring to in my little note to myself there is um, a lot of pieces that begin in minor will often end in major. A good example of that would be Beethoven's Fifth, right? It's in C minor. The last movement's in C major. We get a big grand major. You never see pieces go the other way. It never begins in major and ends in minor. At least not usually. The only example I can think of that's not like... I'm sure there's plenty in like uh, 21st century music and a lot of the later 20th century. And this guy's 20th century, but, but Tedesco's concerto begins in D major and ends in D minor, and it's really cool. And it's the only piece that I really can think of that does that. But I I thought that was an interesting addition. Would have fit much better into the discussion back then, but I'm gonna mark that one off. Dangler's in Italy, I've now talked about. I have an old one here that says bad lyrics segment. I had this idea because one of my favorite bands is Aerosmith. I gotta tell you, Aerosmith, man, I they, that music just does it for me. It gets me pumped up. But uh, I often don't listen to lyrics when I listen to me. I don't really pay attention to lyrics, because most lyrics, I think, are just dumb. Like, most of the bands I like, you know, The Grateful Dead have pretty good lyrics. I think Iron Maiden has good lyrics, but, you know, for the most part. Aerosmith's a good example. I'm not, I would not describe Steven Tyler as a poet. He's one hell of an entertainer. And um, some... <laughs> I was going to do this segment every once in a while where I, like, would recite bad lyrics I found in music that, like, make no sense over, like, some cool classical guitar music. It'd be like, 
you know, spoken word over music. Anyway, maybe that's a stupid idea. Children's recital etiquette. Okay, now this one came about because my daughter had a piano recital. And in Utah, where I live, people have a lot of kids. That's fine. Who doesn't love kids? I love kids. I got three myself. I don't mind lots of kids. But what I don't like is uh, when you bring your eight children to a piano recital, there's just sort of this acceptance where I live. It's going to be rare you hear me complain about Utah, because I love Utah. I love the place I live, but we do have these weird little quirks. But there is just this acceptance here that drives me crazy in that kids are just everywhere, even where maybe they don't belong. And if your baby's screaming, well, don't take it out. Just sit there and let your baby scream over the top. So this was like a year ago, but my daughter was performing in a piano recital and there was this there was a family there and they had like eight kids and they had like these little boys were like running around and they had a baby screaming and like they wouldn't take the baby out so i'm all for like exposing kids to class and okay oh that's that's okay children's recital etiquette is what i wrote here's the thing that bothers me is if it's a children's recital it's often like, people are like, well, it doesn't matter. The audience doesn't really need to be quiet or it's okay if there's kids running around because it's just a kid's recital. But that really bothers me because I know that a bad recital experience can... It can mess you up for a long time. As someone who has dealt with performance anxiety really bad my whole life, like, there's nothing worse than, like, a bad recital to increase that anxiety and it it really bothers me when when people are not respectful of performers I don't care if the performer is four years old the audience should be absolutely silent there I guess unless he's playing Freebird then you know you don't necessarily want a silent audience but uh, actually I had a I had a professor in college and I, I take him at his word but I guess back like when in like Beethoven's time when everyone went to the symphony they would they would like talk the whole time it wasn't music was not treated with the reverence that it is now but still I think I'd rather hear like people BSing at a symphony than I would at a children's recital where the kids up there solo didn't bother my daughter she nailed it but you know you see it. You see kids uh, have little breakdowns, and like I'm just like, oh, dude, keep at it. Okay, there. Got some old ideas off my list. A couple others on here that are a little bit outdated. I have one here that says seasonal horror film recommendations. <laughs> uh, I guess I had. I, I think my idea was like. Maybe each month I recommend a horror movie for that the season, the or maybe the month of the year. But uh, then, of course, if you listen to the previous episode, I don't think there's any need to do that. <laughs> for those of you that did uh, listen to the entire episode last time, I hope you enjoyed it. I clearly won, right? I mean... Look, Jeremy's great, and some of his picks were good, but man, his list was terrible. His list was terrible. Who picks Halloween 3? Halloween 3... Okay. Short thing on Halloween 3. Halloween 3 is often considered an extremely underrated horror movie because it was not a Michael Myers movie. Everybody thought it was going to be, got upset that it wasn't. And so then the more enlightened horror fan says well actually if you get over that issue and just look at it as a standalone movie Halloween 3 is actually really good but it's not it's okay but it's not great what was that other oh Teen Wolf please Teen Wolf yeah his his list was terrible so I clearly won and then um, 
you know, we, we had some friends weigh in and I hit the majority of people. Um, the majority of people said that his list was better and it just reaffirms my awareness that the majority of people are stupid. So I won. I got another thing I, uh, I want to ask the audience about. So for everyone this year has been what it is, right? For me, it, it got really busy and guitar, it's taken a lot of effort to just make sure that there is time to play guitar for me um, because I've just gotten so busy and it's very easy to kick guitar aside out of necessity, not because I want to. I never feel like I play enough. I'm always like upset that I don't get to play guitar as much as I want to, but um, it's been all I can do to just keep some repertoire in my fingers. So composition has taken even a backseat to that. So I haven't composed anything all year, and uh, I, I'm now feeling that that need. Like I really want to start writing some music, and I'm having a pretty pretty strong case of writer's block. And I'm curious what uh, being this a composer's podcast. I know many of you listening, most of you compose I'm wondering how if any of you have tips to get around this I know for me in the past when I've hit writer's block um, sometimes I've always got like you know <laughs> I've always got like 10 ideas going I've always got usually some themes um, but I, I I have found that if I just uh, like muscle through an idea even if I don't think it's very good it helps to just complete a piece, even if it's not a good piece. Just finish it, and it gets the it gets the connectors firing, right? But um, I'm I'm having a hard time doing that. But yeah, I so I I could use I I'm being genuinely serious here. I could use some advice because it sucks. Uh, if you are going to host a classical guitar composing podcast. It might help to be someone who can compose once in a while. <sighs> so, I would love to hear any advice on that that you may have. But I do have a couple ideas, and that's kind of it. So, I have, I think I have broken a little bit of the barrier now. I've kind of got something going, and, and, you know, I don't think it's going to be my greatest work ever. But at least it's moving it feels good to just get some things written. So, hopefully, it will eventually, uh, well, not eventually, I mean, hopefully soon, it will be something tangible that you'll all be able to hear, even if it's not great. I don't mind showing you guys pieces that are my lesser pieces. I just want to get something finished. So. But you know what we do have on the show today? We have some finished compositions from... Someone else. Remember back uh, two episodes ago, we featured some music out of Australia. We will be featuring more from Etienne de Lavox on today's episode, and I'm really looking forward. I I really enjoyed Etienne's pieces, so I'm looking forward to hearing some more of these. So before we get into that, let me get into some emails. I've got a couple of emails that I think I'm going to save some because uh, they will they go with compositions that we'll be featuring in later episodes. So I guess I'll be saving those. But uh, I've had uh, quite a bit of correspondence with uh, my friend and yours, Martin Slater. Let's read some email from Martin. Martin says, Chris, firstly, I hope you are safe from any political unrest. Whichever way you lean politically, we are all going through pretty pretty turbulent times. Maybe our music will begin to reflect some of this, or maybe totally the opposite, a la Mozart. As I am now just one week from finishing my full-time work contract, the time is approaching for me to do, amongst other things, more recording. I have, since first making contact with you, become rather addicted to listening to my old recordings, particularly the studies. I know that you will play them sometime, but I am not in any way suggesting how or when, Still, when I did make the CDs of them, I wrote some accompanying notes. 
I know I have previously said many and various things about them, but my CD notes are as follows. I have a love of the works of Chopin and a fascination with the guitar works of Villalobos and Ponce. The twelve studies are designed to convey particular ideas slash techniques. Example, number one, fast, two, slow, three, tune in treble, four, tune in bass, etc. Study 12 was designed specifically as a finale to the set. Since I wrote that, I have discovered a rather relevant Chopin quote. Nothing is more beautiful than a guitar, except perhaps two. Considering this, it is a pity he never wrote for the instrument, but perhaps I have indirectly paid an homage to his sentiment. Martin. Yeah, I, I've never heard that Chopin quote, but that's pretty cool. And also, I find the notes on your studies interesting, Martin. Anytime I kind of can get a window into the intent behind music, I find it greatly increases my enjoyment of the music. As far as political unrest, yeah, whatever. I, I've made a point on this show that I just don't want to talk about politics. I don't like how they are in everything nowadays, like the world is just kind of saturated with it and it's just kind of a turn off for me I, I either way I, I don't care it's, it's just it's kind of an exhausting subject and um i i prefer to keep it out of this show so but that being said i'm fine and uh i get a little bit of entertainment i guess watching all my friends <laughs> they get they get so worked up not that I don't care or don't have opinions, but that's not what this show's for. I will say this, though. The uh, COVID shutdowns, they're, I mean, they're like, well, they, they've affected my career. I'll just put it that way. And it's like in serious jeopardy of just being permanently eradicated. It's actually been quite depressing. Nonetheless, here I am doing a podcast and... You know, maybe uh, in a few months I'll be doing a podcast from a different point of perspective in life. But um, as of now, the shutdowns are just affecting me on a very personal level. And uh, many, many people that are close to me are suffering majorly because of the shutdowns. Their, you know, mental, mental health depression, suicidal issues. Oh, that just took a somber turn. <laughs> Sorry about that. Regarding the Mozart, uh, Martin brought up an interesting, uh, just sort of a passing comment there, but uh, yeah, Mozart, his life was extremely turbulent. Man, Mozart experienced a lot of, like, there was some painful loss in his life. I know uh, particularly the loss of his son affected him. And I watched this documentary on Mozart. I don't remember what it was called. It was really good, though. But they sort of took you through his life, what we know about his life, and what he was writing at the time. And his music that came about when he lost his son is just so incredibly beautiful and it's it's heartbreaking to hear knowing that that's what he was going through uh, it made me appreciate him even more but more, Mozart's music is extremely joyful in spite of turbulent times and I think that's really cool it's kind of an interesting contrast to say someone like Tchaikovsky if you listen to Tchaikovsky's sixth symphony uh, right before he died Excuse me, I got, he, it premiered, he died, I believe, like two weeks after it premiered, and that piece is extremely dark, and, I mean, there's definitely joy to be found in it, it's one of my all-time favorite pieces, but it's dark, it's moody. I'm not sure how my music reflects my mood, to tell you the truth, I don't really know, I don't think that I'm a good enough composer to really instill that kind of emotion into music, at least to have it come out and affect somebody that way, but uh, Martin brings up an interesting point there. Uh, and then I've, I've had a lot of correspondence with Martin, 
So I'm not going to read it all, but let me uh, just sort of touch base. So Martin has a friend named John, who is president of the guitar society that Martin belongs to, I believe. And Martin was, not Martin, John was good friends with Julian Bream. And so there's been a lot of interesting stuff on Julian Bream. Martin has been diligently trying to see if he can obtain a copy of Julian's trans... What did you call it? A transcription or an arrangement of Paganini's Grand Sonata? Be an arrangement, I guess. I don't know. No, it would be a transcript. What is I mean, the Grand Sonata technically was written for violin and guitar. Anyway, Julian Brim's version is incredible. Martin's working on it. Martin also shared a really neat article with me written by John Mills, his friend, um, about Julian Bream, and it's very long. I'm not going to read it, but I will uh, post a link to it on the website classicalguitarcomposers.com. And then I will read this one final email that Martin has shared, which is a story about Julian Bream from John Mills. I asked Julian once if there had been any defining moments which had had a bearing on his decision to retire. Apparently, in what were to be the final couple of years of his career, he was telephoned by a theater where he had an upcoming recital. The usual questions were raised, lighting, arrival time, program length, interval length, and so on, which were all fine until he was asked if he was bringing any merchandise. What do you mean merchandise? queried Julian. I have no idea what you're talking about. Came the reply, Oh, it's stuff you might want to sell, you know, all the bands and that that have loads of products when they play these gigs. Julian bravely carried on, do you mean CDs and DVDs? Well, I suppose so, but it's more like t-shirts, baseball caps, that sort of stuff people are looking for. Julian told me later that he realized the world had moved on, and it was a world he no longer wished to be a part of. One of the last recitals was given in the tiny church at Alvadiston near Shaftesbury. Now, I can relate this tale due to the kindness of the Southampton Classical Guitar Society. I was in the process of giving a highly enjoyable day of workshops for members of, at Chandler's Ford. The recital was set for, I think, 6.30 that evening, and all week we had been told it was on, then off, and on again, and we were invited. Then we can attend, then must not attend. Kind of sounds like stuff that's going on today. Anyway... Come the afternoon, Kobe received a call from a phone call from Julian, checking if we were coming. There followed urgent discussions, and the society kindly let me leave slightly early, but still I got to the church about 15 minutes after Julian had started. Hearing the beautiful sounds of the Hauser guitar through the partially open door and inquiring if I might go in, was told I would have to listen outside. It was a stunning, calm autumn evening, pink sunlight, a mist rising from the fields, owls hooting, and the sound of Ponce, Bach, Mompau emerging from the church. And I noticed a lady sitting nearby on the steps. Eventually we were allowed in for the final group of pieces by Soar, at which point Julian noticed my entrance and glowered. Hurrying behind to see him at the end, I explained my predicament. Yes, I can see that, said Julian. That woman waiting outside I had refused to allow in, and they therefore couldn't let you in. She's from the area, and she's been trying to move in. And then Martin speculates, I think the latter bit means that this woman was trying to move into his house. Why this might have been can only remain a subject of speculation. Such was Julian's complicated personal life. Maybe this story could be the spark for a dramatic piece of music with perhaps a touch of horror in it? Martin. Yeah, that's about all I can gather too, Martin. That is an interesting, an interesting little, <laughs> little thing there at the end. That a little bit mysterious, but uh, a little more about Julian Bream. And that article on Julian Bream that John Mills wrote is definitely worth a read. So I'll post on today's episode uh, on the blog www.classicalguitarcomposers.com. I'll post a link to that. So let's move on to the real meat and potatoes of the show. This is the point of the podcast where I highly recommend getting yourself an iced tea. Maybe pause for a moment. 
do whatever you need to do. Get your pipe loaded, get in your comfy chair, glass of iced tea, and sit back and enjoy this next segment. Okay, so as I had said earlier, we're going to be hearing some more music from Etienne de Lebach. Etienne hails to us from Australia. And I'm very much looking forward to these pieces. We're going to get right into them. This first piece is called The Guitar Lesson.
Okay, and this next piece is called Shadows of Spain. <laughs> Thank you. 
And finally, we're going to end with a set of pieces. These are five shorter ones. It's called Five Naive Pictures. And that title kind of struck me in a way that I actually looked up naive because I've never heard of an alternate meaning to naive other than lacking knowledge or whatever. But uh, I found this definition online that I think is probably more uh, Etienne's intent. And if I'm wrong, I apologize, Etienne. But the title, Five Naive Pictures, makes sense to me with this definition. And since I didn't know it, I'm just going to assume nobody knew it, right? <laughs> but uh, I like this definition. It says, of or denoting art produced in a straightforward style that deliberately rejects sophisticated artistic techniques and has a bold directness resembling a child's work, typically in bright colors with little or no perspective. Here is Five Naive Pictures by Etienne de la Vox. And they are subtitled as follows. I'm going to just tell you them all now, and then we'll play them straight through. The first one is called Rock Pools, followed by Kites, followed by Ants in a Thunderstorm. The fourth is Moonlight over the Sea. And finally, A Bird's Lullaby.
And there it is. We have just heard The Guitar Lesson, Shadows of Spain, and Five Naive Pictures by Etienne de la Vox. And also, Etienne uh, said that if anyone is interested in playing any of these pieces, he's happy to provide the sheet music free of charge. If you are interested, let me know, and I will pass his email along to you. And that is going to wrap up our show today. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining me. Please remember, you can go to classicalguitarcomposers.com for any further links to all, all things featured on the episodes. Just click on the episode you're looking for, and you'll see provided links to the composers we feature, as well as a few other tidbits. Also this, if you'd like to support the show, a great way to do that is to purchase sheet music. You get to help the show and a little something in return. You can buy either of the two suites of mine that I've featured on the show. Just at that same website, you click on the sheet music tab. I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. I will be back with another episode next month. Until then, keep on plucking. Mm-hmm.